work in Columbus, Ohio. I'm not from there. I just want to clarify that. Um, so most people have been talking about using stem cells, introducing stem cells to cure human disease. I'm going to, I'm the only um, person in my category actually. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, killing stem cells to cure human disease. But um, w in this case, we're talking about tumor stem cells. So similar to embryonic stem cells, mesenchymal stem cells, the tumor stem cell co um, concept is that tumor stem cells are a subpopulation of the tumor that are necessary for self-renewal of the tumor and, and to perpetuate the tumor. So um, glioma tumor models um, are necessary because uh, brain tumors are in a unique compartment. Um, the capillaries have tight junctions, so there's a, there's a brain blood, blood brain barrier. Many small molecules don't pass in. Uh, generally, lipophilic molecules are less than 400 kD will. However, the blood tumor barrier, um, is particularly adult gliomas, the main one being glioblastoma, uh, may be leaky, and, and some drugs that will not pass the blood brain barrier will get into the tumor. Um, so the, the, the sort of the older um, preclinical tumor models for screening uh, experimental therapeutics involved injecting tumor cells into the flank of an animal. Um, but that really doesn't work for evaluating brain tumor um, experimental therapeutics because of the, the you, you don't have the blood-brain barrier. So in order to do that, um, you know, you need to model it. And so we, the, the sort of the gold standard now is the orthotopic human uh, xenograft mouse model. Um, so human uh, glioma cells are implanted into the, um, an immunofficient rodent, usually the, the nude mouse, um, to model the blood-brain barrier. So the tumor grows inside the cranial cavity. Um, it, it models what we would see in a human being. Now, traditionally, we've used these um, uh, monolayer uh, cell lines, which are cell lines that were derived from human tumors, cultured uh, ad nauseum hundreds of times, but it's been the, the tumor model. And some of the more popular ones are U87 and, and U251. Now, again, the current gold standard, though, is to use the um, glioma tumor stem-like cells. Some people call them glioma stem cells. Others say tumor stem-like cells because, of course, there would be differences between normal stem cells. Now, we also have uh, syngeneic grafts that do have their uses, where, where you have a, uh, a mouse um, tumor implanted into a mouse, and so you have an intact immune system. So one thing that's um, very, you know, um, interest, a high interest in uh, brain tumor therapy is immunotherapy. So, in a, so that's a, a limitation of the orthotopic uh, xenograft models. You don't, uh, you don't have an immune system. The, the really the best model is a dog spontaneous glioma model. Um, we just had um, um, a, a dental scientist up, and it turns out that dogs with a brachycephalic face, you know, the pushed in face, the bulldog and the boxers, they have a high incidence of spontaneous glioblastoma. So the, the thing that's really good about the dog model is the dogs have a big brain. And if you remember any of your pharmacokinetics, um, there's partition coefficients. And one limitation of the, of the mouse model is that, you know, you have a very small um, amount of tissue to pass. It doesn't mimic the human brain. So, and also the, the tumors in the spontaneous dog model very histopathologically resemble human glioblastomas. But, you know, that's, that's not a practical model. Um, in, a, in a busy veterinary hospital, they may see, you know, two, three, four, five, a month, but that's something that can be planned. So it turns out for high throughput and to man and to model the human um, condition the best, the the um, the orthotopic uh, glioma stem cell model is the best model. So um, am I going? To, okay. So we talked about the stem cells being the subpopulation that can propagate the tumor. It turns out that the glioma tumor stem cell like cells are also more resistant to chemotherapy and radiation. You know, radiation and a couple alkylating agents are the mainstay of treating human glioblastoma right now. So if these are the cells that are going to propagate the tumor, they're going to be responsible for the tumor to, to recur, and they're going to be resi more, most resistant to therapy, those are the cells that you want to aim your treatment at to see if the, 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 to test if a drug's going to be efficacious in a clinical situation. 
So um, glioma tumor stem cells, um, they grow as neurospheres in the absence of serum with um, growth factor supplementation, much like the original um, neural stem cells were isolated from rodent brains as growing as neurospheres. Um, in contrast to that, I mentioned the old-fashioned monolayer lines. This is uh, the U87 uh, glioma cells, and they, you know, they look like fibroblasts or a little squatter maybe, a little more cytoplasm in, as any other cell line. But this is what neurospheres look like, you know, floating in your, in your culture. Um, one aspect of working with neurospheres as far as treating them with drugs is, you know, it does have a 3D structure. So when we treat with drugs, occasionally we have to break up the neurospheres because there's going to be reduced penetration inside the sphere compared to the cells that are out floating in the media. So there's a, you know, a lot of different markers that have been used through the, through the short time that uh, glioma stem cells have been studied. And one of them is uh, the hematopoietic stem cell marker, or um, CD133. It turns out that it's not really restricted to glioma stem cells. There are some glioma stem cells that behave like stem cells that are, that are not CD133 positive. Uh, CD44 is also a little bit more uh, broad, um, broadly expressed. Um, SOX2, Musashi1, Nestin, of course, are a little bit more neural specific, although they're found in other stem, stem cell and progenitor cell um, systems. So they would be more neural progenitor cell specific. Beta catenin is also a, a little bit, again, a little less specific, but it's been shown to be required for neural differentiation of embryonic stem cells and proliferation of neural pr pro progenitor cells. Okay, just to illustrate some of the points I've been mentioning, here's three cultures of, of glioblastoma cells derived from people. And the GS1 is gliosarcoma, it's a related tumor, it's kind of minutiae, you can consider that a glioblastoma. And um, we can see that uh, the TR is tumor recurrence for that case. The T is tumor, and the T is, uh, the T is tumor, so that's, the, that's, a, that's a western blot of a, derived from a sample from a patient's actual tumor. And the neurospheres are the cells that have been isolated from the patient. So basically, in a, in a neuro-oncology program that does this, you know, which are there, there are several now, um, but so if you have a really good tumor bank, you need to take the, you need to get a sample of the tumor while the patient's being operated on and um, immediately start mincing it up and growing out your neurospheres. So we have the neurospheres, and then we, in the, in the serum-free medium, and then the, the the, you see the FBS, the patches three. So anyway, what you can see is, is as, this, as the primary tumors express lower levels of the, of the glioma stem cell marker, because they're more of a mixed population. Um, the, 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 I don't know what the exact percentages are, but the, the, the tumor stem cells in, in an actual patient tumor are, are a, a minority of the cells. But when, so the, the neurosphere cells, though, that's an enrichment for tumor stem cells. So, but anyway, you can see that the, um, the, um, the markers, uh, SOX2, and it, in, in this case, which is a good marker, is, is high in the neurospheres. And as you, and as you take the cells out of the um, serum-free medium and put them in serum, then they, then they don't express the uh, stem cell characteristics again. So what can you do with this stem cell model? Well, you can do, you know, what you can do with any other cells in, in old-fashioned preclinical pharmacology. Um, you can do growth inhibition, clonogenic assays, metabolism, apoptosis, differentiation, senescence, which turns out to be more important when you're using uh, tumor stem cells than when you're using a regular uh, old-fashioned tumor cell line. And you can do invasion assays. So um, in, to illustrate this, um, you know, I'll show some of my work with an Aurora, Aurora A kinase inhibitor. And I, we don't need to read everything on this slide, but Aurora A kinase is, is, a, is a mitotic uh, serine 3 kinase that is important for maturation of the centrosome and spindle, so, and also the G2M progression for exit from mitosis. So it's important for mitotic progression. It also um, stabilizes um, proliferative signals like beta catenin and NMIC, um, and we'll, we'll talk about that why. The interacting proteins are really not important in this context. It also um, phosphorylates P53, and um, it turns out to be important in maintaining embryonic stem cell self renewal, renewal and uh, pluripotency. And the reason is, is, is the reason it stabilizes beta catenin, NMIC, CMIC, uh, P53, and, and, and others is because um, it acts, 
Well, it, it stabilizes beta-catenin in NMIC because it inactivates a kinase, um, GSK3, GSK beta-3, which is important um, when, when, when the, when, when the um, transcription factors are phosphorylated by GSK beta-3, they're, they're, they're tagged for recognition of a ubiquitin ligase and undergo ubiquitin-dependent proteolysis. So um, Aurora A keeps that process at bay so the transcription factors can accumulate. In contrast, um, Aurora A will directly um, phosphorylate P53 and targeting it for recognition by uh, mouse double minute, it's also called human double minute, or other ligases involved in the ubiquitination of P53. And this is just kind of a, um, another scheme of that process. But notice the relationship with P53 is important. Uh, Aurora A autophosphorylates itself and that um, on 3 and 288, and that makes it active, and then that will um, phosphorylate P53, um, leading uh, to uh, its destruction. So, um, if I skipped one. All right, so, so we wanted to use the glioma stem cell model to evaluate this, pre this, 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 this drug as a possible human therapy. And um, this is the way I, we show it in our, in our paper, but actually we didn't do it this way. And it kind of illustrates some of the differences of working with uh, uh, cancer stem cells versus regular cancer cells. And, and the, on the upper right-hand panel, you can see an MTT assay. An MTT assays basically measure metabolism. So in our previous work, we already knew this drug killed glioma cells and cancer cells. And you can see that um, within high drug concentrations, uh, in nanomolars, um, that it really doesn't seem to affect the metabolism as much as we might expect. So we thought, oh, wait a minute, how, how can this be? All of a sudden, this is a bad drug. And then we went around and we did the traditional cell proliferation assay in the upper left and um, lower left with a different drug showing that, yes, it does, it does kill the cells. So um, we'll get to, in, in a moment, why that, why that is. Now, for, a, for apoptosis, we just did an exon labeling after treating the cells for, you know, the higher peaks are the drug treated and the lower bars are the, are the controls. But you can see that it doesn't really cause apoptosis of 100% of the cells, maybe like 15%, 20% uh, escape. And um, so, so, what, so what's, what's important um, for uh, a chemotherapy drug? Well, you, you want it to stop proliferation, but well, you really, I mean, you don't want the cancer to, to grow. So, we, so the MTT data suggests there's some cells hanging around. So what we did is we did a um, sort of a washout assay in the upper right for proliferation, um, where w after about six days in culture, if we allow the cells to recover after that treatment, they, they wouldn't grow anymore. So it seemed to be a permanent or at least a semi-permanent a loss of the proliferative potential. Now, um, for a clonogenic assay is another old-fashioned fashion technique that's actually very powerful. Um, one of the reasons I emphasize this, in a, in a lot of uh, this type of uh, preclinical pre cancer pharmacology, people go to sort of the easy assays, the kits, you know, the MTT assay, and there's a, an LDH release assay, and it turns out that the old assays really tell you a lot more, and the new assays can be misleading. So this is, you know, clonogenic assay, meaning you plate cells. You can either treat them first or, or plate them and then treat them. And you, it's in a dilute, you, you plate the cells dilutely, so one cell will form one colony. So you're checking the ability of that cell to make a little mini tumor or to grow and proliferate and make a colony. And it's, it's a very simple assay, um, but, it, but it's very powerful and you just count colonies and get toxicity. And that's what it looks like for monolayer cells. But for neurospheres, um, if, you let, if you really let them attach to the dish, then they want to start differentiating. So we, just, we can do the same thing in soft agar, and you know, we found that our drug was very effective at low concentrations in neurosphere and soft agar. And um, we looked for synergy with the standard alkylating agent temozolomide that's used in almost every glioblastoma patient at one time and radiation and found at some concentrations there was synergy. So another thing that we did is um, we noticed in the monolayer cell lines that most of the cells would be killed, but there'd be a few cells that were really big with a lot of cytoplasm. 
or a few cells that had that were multinuclear, which is also a known mechanism of blocking Aurora A because it causes a mitotic catastrophe, genomic instability. Uh, you 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 know you can replicate the genome and you can't you can't um, progress through anaphase. So you get a you get a non-disjunction event of sort of the whole nucleus. And some of the cells seem to like form long processes like they were becoming astrocytes. So we did a similar thing with the, the, the glioblastoma stem cells. And, um, and the, these are just two different lines derived from two different patients. And below is, our, is treated with our Aurora A inhibitor. And you can see this is taken at the same magnification that there are some very large cells in the treated cultures and some cells that are forming processes suggesting differentiation. And because this is a suspension cell line, we were to be able to treat these cells and then spin them onto a slide in something called a cytospin and uh, do a beta-gal assay just for more um, evidence that we are getting some um, senescence. Uh, so you can, uh, of course, you can do western blots to look for the same things. And you can see in these three cell lines that we had sort of a loss of stemness, Musashi, CD44, nestin in most cases and an increase in differentiation, GFAP being the astrocytic uh, intermediate filament differentiation. OLIG2 is an astrocytic and uh, oligodendrocyte transcription factor. A ALD H1L is also uh, uh, an astrocytic marker. And we also had some apoptosis. Um, in addition, we had an increase in, in uh, the, the cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitor P21, which is associated with, with senescence. So we have evidence of a lack of stemness, some senescence, and an and, and increased differentiation. So, you know, really, it, it doesn't matter if we don't kill all the cells as long as we stop them from proliferating. In the next slide, we, we also treated the cells with our Aurora inhibitor. And uh, we did another cytospin experiment where we just um, spun the cells onto a slide. And then you can, you can fix them with ethanol or acetone and stain them. And this is just an H&E stain uh, showing on, on the, on the, on the left-hand panel the, the large increase in the, the cell size and the, uh, and the nuclear ploidy. And we use an old stain called a flugen stain, which is, has a very um, uh, exact correlation with nucleic acid material. So you can actually do image analysis and get ploidy that way. And we, and we sort of uh, collaborate, collaborate um, verify that with image analysis. So that brings us to, so that's sort of the, you know, the usefulness of the neurospheres, the different kind of things you can do with the neurospheres, the, the glioma neurospheres. But now what can you do with the xenograph model? Of course, you can do your traditional Kaplan-Meier analysis to see if you prolong the survival of the mice with your treatment. And you can do target hit confirmation. So basically, we anesthetize the mice. We put them in this apparatus. We, put a, we open up their scalp, and we put a little um, capillary pipette there and inject tumor, neurosphere tumor cells in them. They're going to, in my, in my system, they're going to be nude mice. That was just a slide someone gave me. Um, and the Bregma is just a marker. But anyway, if you, if you, you can take out the brains, fix them, and you get nice tumors. Um, one thing about the neurospheres is, again, they more closely recapitulate human tumors. So on the left, that's an H&E slide of the human tumor. And on the right, those are um, sections from the mouse brain where the neurospheres were implanted. Uh, so the, uh, the, the traditional lines don't do that so well. They're not as invasive. They don't show the, the pseudopalisadine necrosis, which is uh, um, characteristics of GBM. And luckily, which you know made everything nice, uh, we did get an increase in survival in these mice when we treated them with Aurora A inhibitor and two cell lines. But sort of the really part that was sort of elegant and a very simple, simple system uh, was the target hit confirmation. So we after, so we treated some mice and and we and let them. The tumors grow a little while under treatment and sacrifice them. And on the left, we can see the H&E. And we can see a similar effect on the, on the cell ploidy that we saw in a vitro. And we can see that the drug is working through the phospho aurora staining. So again, that's the activated form. So if you inhibit it, it, it has less autophosphorylation. And we can see the effects on the um, chromosomes that um, were really the how Aurora got its name. So you see on the lower right, those really big 
mitotic um, big um, sort of metaphase and pro-metaphase spreads on uh, here at kind of higher magnification. And you can see this is, um, this is how they were, uh, some photos of the, of the original Drosophila mutant which, which in which the uh, protein was discovered. So um, that's, uh, that's our use of uh, glioma tumor stem cells in a preclinical uh, evaluation of uh, experimental therapeutic. Thank you.